good morning to all our Facebook uh, and YouTube viewers, those that are watching uh, by uh, the internet. Uh, this again is uh, December the 13th, the second Sunday uh, of Advent, and uh, our text uh, has been set to music by Handel in the work Messiah. And the context of this particular piece of poetry comes from Isaiah forecast and John the Baptist it is the first Old Testament prophecy fulfilled uh, in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Atura, and of the region of Tranconitis, and uh, Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caphias, uh, uh, being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. He came unto, in, into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, uh, the prophet saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways that shall be made shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation. Of God. I'm going to talk about a voice in the wilderness, a voice in the wilderness. In its original context, this uh, piece of poetry is addressed to Jews in exile in Babylon. And uh, please remember that uh, while in Babylon, the captors tried to influence the Jews uh, to forget their Jewish perceptions of reality, to redefine their lives exclusively by imperial Babylonian definitions of what is what much in the same way that the plantation owners did uh, in this country to the imported slaves and the immigrants in the Western expansion uh, of, uh, concerning the Native Americans and the Indians. Uh, in fact, it is Babylonian star worship where we get many of our present day symbolic concepts. Uh, many people may not realize this, but uh, in Babylonian star worship, black meant dark, which meant bad, while white meant light, which meant good. Now, you can see easily how that has been misappropriated uh, as it relates to race. White as, they use the phrase white as snow, meaning purity, whereas black as sin, meaning impurity. Again, that's, uh, that's, that's racist uh, the theology. Uh, weddings, you, you see this in, in every, uh, every part of the country, weddings, the bride wears white, where at funerals people wear black. How many of y'all grew up watching the Lone Ranger? The Lone Ranger wore white, rode on a white horse, while the villains wore black with a black horse. Many years ago, uh, in Gainesville, Georgia, the Klan marched using a float entitled I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. And you can see how these Babylonian star worship uh, symbols have been uh, indoctrinated into our thinking in this country. Myths and customs have just as much power as the truth if you believe it. Now these Jews out of Babylon are told that they are privileged to live within one of the greater, most noble, most beautiful civilizations ever Devised. Isn't it very interesting that the ones who overtake, rape, and ruin other people's culture in the name of spreading so-called civilization always consider those that they overtake as the barbarians or the heathens. Again, like the slaves and the Indians, the Jews are told to forget their culture and take on the Babylonian ways. But many of the Jews don't consider Babylon a civilization at all but a wilderness. They make a covenant not to forget, not to be seduced by Babylonian poets. You've seen this in the book of Psalms 
in uh, the 137th division, uh, verses 1 through 6, it says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing unto us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land, they said. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. To sing the Lord's song was to remind them that they were exiles. And there must have been Jews who did not consider themselves exiles. Yes, they have settled in, they made it home, assimilated, and learned Babylonian songs to replace their songs of Zion, but not the ones quoted by Isaiah. Never mind the extravagance, the rich food, the fine homes, the exquisite gardens. They knew that they were in the wilderness, and they, as well as anyone, remembered the wilderness. To these Jews, the wilderness was a desolate, a, desolate, a lonely place, a disorderly Dangerous place, the home of wild beasts, barbarians more savage than any animal. Animals killed uh, for food and humans killed for sport. To them, wilderness meant that pathless place where they once were freed from Egyptian bondage and Pharaoh. And they came to a place full of fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground. To them, wilderness meant wild. The place where people get bewildered. It was in the wilderness, according to Isaiah 49 and 14, that it says, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. Forget your modern ecological romanticism. We're not talking about Boy Scouts and John Denver and singing about Colorado or a frame condominiums for summer homes. The wilderness to these Jews is a place where they lost their way. They couldn't find home. They bowed before alien gods and golden calves. You remember the story about the prodigal son? He knew about the wilderness. You remember the Bible says a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto him his living. And, and, and he went many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. It's going to turn into a wilderness. Far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. Now it's a wilderness. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him to the fields to feed swine. Now to a Jewish person, to deal with pigs was the lowest of low. And he would have fain, the scripture says, have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave to him. And he came to himself, and he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. The wilderness, the wilderness that I'm referring to today in our message, please understand it's not a place, it's a state of mind. It's a metaphor to, uh, to describe a terrifying situation where wild beasts live. There are no clear paths in the wilderness. There's, no, there's chaos in the wilderness. There's, there's temptation and bewilderment in the wilderness. Wilderness is a metaphor for the address of many people People who are listening to me this morning, you may think you're in the wilderness. We may not want to own it, but we live in a wilderness. Just like some Jews tried to assimilate themselves into the values of the Babylonian culture, some people today, yes, look upon our culture and sense no conflict between cultural values and moral values. But don't be brainwashed by this. Amoral or immoral world. This societal attitude of moral relativity, the world where people say there is no absolutes, where whatever feels good, just do it. You only live once, you might as well live it up. 
This life of double standards where right and wrong depend upon who's calling the shots. I mean, we see that in our, in our government today. Right and wrong, it depends on who's calling the shots. Money talks and everybody, everything else walks. Where you had better look out for number one. Where America is, is supposed to be the home of the free and the brave and the land of the free, uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, and it's getting better all the time. We're making America great again. Oh, come on. That's propaganda. I mean, uh, make America great uh, again. When was it a great? Was it, was it great when slavery was here? Was it great when Jim Crow was here? What do you mean, make America great again? This world that you and I live in, as nice as it is, is really a wilderness. We, we, we're self-destructive in, in this country and in our society with alcohol and cocaine and crack and ice and crystal meth and high cholesterol and debt and stress and nerves and fear and depression, HIV virus and now COVID-19. Uh, man, it's, it, it, uh, it's got our society all in chaos. Instead of promoting abstinence, one partner in marriage, we're falsely advertising practice Quote, safe sex, condoms never have been foolproof in preventing pregnancy, and they're not going to be foolproof in stopping the AIDS epidemic. Now, somebody might be thinking out there listening to this message this morning, well, pastor, you know, safe sex is more realistic because they're going to do it anyway. Well, using that logic, we should say that the people are going to smoke crack anyway, so let's give them a clean crack pipe. Or they're going to visit prostitutes anyway, so let's show them where they find the careful ones. And they're going to buy weapons anyway, so let's just make it easier for them to get guns. Praise God. This world we live in is not a paradise. It is a wilderness. I mean, we're shooting ourselves for no reason. The arsenals of our young people are more state-of-the-art than the police forces that are equipped to stop them. We've got pickup trucks driving into restaurants and blowing people away. We've fired employees that go back and blow their co-workers away. We have crack dealers putting their young children at risk of being shot and killed by police officers in raids. We have teenagers molesting small kids. We have police forces, uh, some people, some police forces, who are killing people without uh, recourse in this country. Children stabbing others and parents burning places down to cover it up. Uh, we got crooked politicians. I know it don't take a rocket science to figure that out. Abusive law enforcement officials. And yes, even amoral uh, preachers of the gospel. We have men raping women, and because of who they are and how much money they can afford to spend on legal defense, they get off. You tell me, is this home uh, or is this a wilderness? No wonder T.S. Eliot entitled his great poem about the modern world, The Wasteland. John the Baptist's portrait from Isaiah makes sense only to those people who read their context as wilderness, a place of crooked, treacherous paths, high, unscalable mountains, and dark, unreachable valleys. This is liberating poetry because it enables us to be honest about our situations and call what it is, wilderness. It's poetry that liberates also because it proclaims a way out of the wilderness. In a wild place where only the shrieks of beasts are heard, we can still hear a voice in the wilderness announcing, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Because we can't find our way out to him, he seeks us out and finds his way to us. The scripture says the Lord comes. People in exile in the wilderness are usually either serenely secure or despondently depressed. They have lived in this remote wild called so long they think it is normal. They've been depressed and powerless because they cannot see any way out. Unfortunately, unfortunately, some marriages are, are like wildernesses. We think our marriage is normal because we have gotten used to the abuse or we're depressed because we can't see our way out. It is the portrait of Isaiah and John's messianic tenor that announces that there is a way out. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Hear it again today now. This God bulldozes his way through the jungle to get to us because we could not get to him. 
There is a way out of the wilderness. Martin Luther King Jr. said one day, I have a dream. You know, people who don't dream, people who don't sing songs, people who don't have great expectation, people who don't believe for better become trapped in whatever the politicians or the news reporters tell us or our own life circumstances dictate to us. Just like the young man said, if it ain't one thing, it's another. They even give us songs like K Sara, say Sara, Sara, whatever will be, what it will be. And I used to hear this song years ago. I've been down so long, down don't bother me. But I came here today to tell you don't roll over and play dead. Don't give up, don't give out, don't give in. John the Baptist spoke to those people in the wilderness in first century Rome and occupied Judea by quoting poetry of sixth century Babylonian ex exiled Israel. Both were summoned home from the wilderness by a voice. And here we are today, a voice crying in the wilderness saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. John, the Advent preacher, paved the way for the birth of Jesus Christ. And thank God Jesus came and gave us a way out of the wilderness. He came that you and I might have life and have it more abundantly. He came that we may be found and then follow him. He came that we might have joy unspeakable and full of glory. He came that we might receive the peace of God that passes all understanding. He came that we might walk through the valley of the shadows of death, fearing no evil because he's with us. He came that we might know the way, the truth, in the life. He came down so we could go up. He came here that we might go there. He came to us so we could go to him. He came to earth so we could go to heaven. He came to where we are that we could go where he is. He came to save us so we could serve him. He came to live in our hearts so we could live in the presence of God forever. The old hymn writer penned the words, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Lay down thy weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary, worn, and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. Yes, yes, we live in a wilderness, but it is in our home, at least not in this present state. For the present, we are insulated, but not isolated. For the present, we are in this world, but not of this world. For the present, we have been delivered from the power of darkness and have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. This is the Advent message. Hear it again today. Prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Those who are listening to us this morning by way of uh, YouTube or Facebook, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know Jesus Christ came to this world for you. If he didn't, if he didn't come for anybody else, he came for you. All you have to do is say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I believe that you came to this world to forgive me of my sins and to give me a new life. And I receive you now in Jesus' name. My friend, if you prayed that prayer, I believe you got born again. I encourage you. In fact, I beg you, find you a good Bible-believing church. In fact, this is a good church. You come into this church, and a year from now, you won't even recognize your own spiritual growth. It will, it will have just gone past whatever you can believe. Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.